Aloha mai kako. Welcome everyone. My name is Audrey Kitagawa. I'm the founder and president of the International Academy for Multicultural Cooperation. You can learn more about the Academy by clicking on the link in the chat box. We are pleased to present the gift of aloha, love in selfless service. As part of the Interfaith Ohana of Hawaii Network of Faith Communities, the meaning of which we are using for the word aloha today is love. Today, we are pleased to bring to you five individuals who embody their aloha in selfless service in their tireless work year after year for the betterment of humanity. Each has approached service in his or her own way, but all have had huge impact upon the lives of others, bringing with them their inspiration, hope, and demonstrating the power of their love to create profound and positive change in the world. I will be your moderator today and you will be able to read more about each presenter by clicking on the link in the chat box, which will contain their long biographies. Their work and presence in the world have been so remarkable that I'd like to get right to them to maximize our opportunity to hear about the work. Our first panelist today is Ben Bowler. He is the executive director of Unity Earth a global network building a worldwide movement for unity and peace. He has initiatives that run the year round, but has an incredible initiative called World Unity Week, where individuals and organizations can join on an international internet platform. Last year, approximately 30 million persons tuned in during the week. Welcome, Ben Bowler. Please share with us about your amazing work. Well, thank you, uh, Miss Audrey Kitagawa. Aloha, dear friends. It's an honor to be here with you, with such esteemed uh, fellow panelists, uh, and welcome to everybody here in the room and those watching out uh, on social media live and later. It's a very auspicious day, uh, too, and this program uh, that uh, the International Academy of Multicultural Cooperation has convened is a, is a very important part of the commemorations of today. Uh, Audrey has asked me to speak a little bit about Unity Earth and the journey over the years. And I think it's something that to really distill down what the essence of our work has been and is and will continue to be, is to forge those threads of spiritual unity um, between cultures, between faith traditions, between all different spiritual communities on the planet, um, together in a spirit of hope, uh, and action as well as the grassroots activism. Um, and we'll hear from Bishop Swing later in the United Religions Initiative, uh, who has been such an important partner for us. But this work has been to bring communities together, to break down the barriers of mistrust, to break down the barriers of fear and suspicion, which comes ultimately from ignorance. Uh, and the more that we can get to know each other, the more, and this is our experience, the more we love one another. And it's that spirit of love, that spirit of aloha, that is our last great hope for humanity and for the earth. And that's why today is such an important occasion. We're seeing that there are people and groups and groups of groups all over the world that are getting the call to respond to this spirit of service, to this spirit of giving, of generosity, and of service, inspired by different and a variety of plurality of, of spiritual traditions, religions, indigenous wisdoms, and responding to their own personal call to work for the betterment of humanity. My mother reminded me last night, Audrey, when I was preparing for today, that selfless service can happen in any station in life. It can be in the most humble in the most humble places, in the most humble stations and, and, and jobs that people are serving with a spirit of love. It's not that we need to go and found a new international NGO to, to be a part of the spirit of service. You can get it working in the bakery. You can get it working in the government institutions. You can get it working anywhere. And to spread the love and that energy of selfless service. Our work with Unity Earth these last years 
has been to connect a variety of organizations coming together to stand and build a platform that is visible, that incorporates indigenous wisdom, faith traditions, emerging spiritualities, and humanitarian service. And in, in 2020, during the beginning of the lockdown, together with our partners at the Sign Network and Unify and the United Religions Initiative, we launched the first World Unity Week. And one thing I will, I will say, all of the problems that we face from the environmental degradation to political unrest, uh, to wars and rumors and rumblings of wars, all, all of this is a function of our disunity. So our work has been to build these threads of commonality and unity. And so to bring groups together and World Unity Week is convened around the mid-year solstice. And it was convened by hundreds of organizations, including by Ms. Audrey Kitagawa, uh, and, and Jonathan Granoff and many others that came together to declare World Unity Week. It wasn't the institutions, it was civil society coming together, that rising force. And there is great power in this when we come together, enabled by the technology uh, and supported um, by emerging um, financial groups and institutions as well. So there is something very exciting in that. World Unity Week coming up again uh, in June 18 to 25, you can find it at worldunityweek.org. But we invite everybody to come and connect and show us what you are doing. Connect with others who are inspired to the call as well, perhaps to work on different parts of the great work that is before us. We have an assembly tomorrow. And if you'd like to join the World Unity Week assembly, um, you can find it on Facebook or in, in the chat here. We'll place it a little bit later. Coming up later this year too, Audrey, and this is very important, a great peacemaker passed several months ago in Avon Madison. And the legacy that she's left with Pathways to Peace is profound, a profound demonstration of selfless service, including the commemoration of the International Day of Peace every September 21. We are together with many other organizations convening Peace Week this year because the International Day of Peace is a Wednesday. So this gives us this, the weekend to weekend to unite many peace efforts around the world and around the planet, not just for the International Day of Peace, but for events that are the weekend before, of which there are so many, and the weekend after to show up as a connected whole so that we can see the power of the, the sheer number of people in this transformational movement. And the International Day of Peace is a very powerful um, poll, which is an orientating force for many. And finally, I'd like to mention the work of Purpose Earth, if I may. This is an organization that lives also within Unity Earth um, and has uh, coming into its second uh, and third year already Purpose Earth, which is a grant and mentorship program for grassroots initiative, has raised and given away over $200,000. There are 28 grant recipients around the world. This is a beautiful living example of selfless service. There are more recipients being announced, and these are small community groups in Africa and in India and in different parts of the world that are alive for purpose. Their statement is this, we believe purpose is the most powerful tool for transformation. It's this belief that inspires our mission to support purpose-driven people and projects with creative solutions to our global challenges. You can find more about Purpose Earth at purposeearth.org and you can support them at purposeearth.org slash donate. And I wanted to share that because this is a very important example of the, the, the loving service um, and how people practically can be involved to support people around the world. So we invite you to come and connect with a growing grassroots global movement for civil society and activists all around the world in the spirit of unity for World Unity Week, where Miss Audrey has been a, a global ambassador, um, to connect with us for our collective peace efforts in September, and to support the work of grassroots activists through Purpose Earth. And these, Audrey, are some of the main ways in which I have been called and the community of Unity Earth has been called uh, into our service. And remember that loving service can happen in any station, wherever you are at, in daily interactions within our own, within our own families, perhaps is the most important part of it. And, but thank you, Audrey, and thank you to the IAMC for convening this extremely important um, presentation today. It's an honor to be with you. Thank you so much, Ben. You know, you never cease to amaze me how you can possibly keep track of the many initiatives and people that you work with from all around the world. You have an incredible memory. 
And of course, just as you shared, you know, we just got off a program sharing about Martin Luther King. And, you know, Martin Luther King said, everybody can be great. You don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace. And yes, indeed, grace and love. Thank you so much, Ben. So our next presenter is Jonathan Granoff. Jonathan is an attorney author and international advocate emphasizing the legal and ethical dimensions of human development and security, focusing on advancing the rule of law to address global security and the threats posed by nuclear weapons. He is a recipient of the Rutgers University School of Law's Arthur E. Ermitage Distinguished Alumni Award, which I myself was privileged to attend. And he is also a 2014 nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Jonathan, you now have the floor. Audrey, my dear, dear sister, sister of the heart, sister of the spirit, sister of love, and the spiritual family that you're part of that teaches that um, we have to have hearts without borders. In today's world, this is a unique moment in world history in which the admonition of the wise to see the human family as one has become a practical necessity. The pandemic doesn't have borders. The climate doesn't have borders. The, the uh, phytoplankton that provides 50 to 70 percent of our oxygen doesn't, uh, doesn't care what religion you are, what race you are what class you're in, it's breathing all of us. And so it should give us hearts of gratitude. I want to talk about the power of love and how important that is. And I want to give an example of how I saw it in, in action and how it inspires the work that I do today. I was with a saint, a wise man named Guru Bawa Mahayadin. They just called him Bawa. He was well over 100 in a relatively poor, not relatively poor, a very poor section, amongst the poorest of the poor in Sri Lanka, northern Sri Lanka, in 1974, over 50 years ago. I was young, I was vigorous, I was very strong. I was sitting at his, I was at his, uh, by his bedside, corrugated steel roof, a cement floor, in very, very poor circum situation there. Uh, water was gotten out of a well. There were... Uh, Prime ministers came to see him and beggars came to see him. He treated everyone the same as part of himself. A person had had some personal tragedies in his life and blamed the saint for it and came bursting into the ashram, brandishing a machete. And he was just a few feet from, from us. I, I could have easily sucker punched him to stop this threat. But my conscience said not to. I can't tell you how much I love this elder wise man, but my conscience said, wait. The man with the machete raised the machete. He was shaking with anger. He was screaming. He was fo literally foaming at the mouth. And the saint opened up his neck, and I could feel as if the, as if I could feel as if the very, air was scintillating with the power of love and grace. And he said to the man, will taking my life, as he, as, he, as, he, as he just opened his neck, will taking my life give your soul the peace that it is seeking? And it was, and it was as if uh, a puppet had had, its, had, had its, its, uh, its strings cut and he collapsed, and I caught him. The, the machete fell to the side. I caught him. And uh, Bawa, the saint, uh, embraced him and said, go home, clean yourself, and come back. So I saw a man facing evil, not as a strategy, it was spontaneous. The, I saw such a power of love emanate from an individual. And his concern was the well-being of the other. And the man felt that. And that's been a guidepost of how the power of love can face evil and act. And all of the problems we have amongst nations arise because of misunderstanding, 
misperception, fear, anger, and not understanding that as long as we take the position of institutionalized adversity, which certainly nuclear weapons do, which certainly the military national model of security does, we will not be understanding what drives those who in Afghanistan are depriving women of their fundamental rights, in the Ukraine who are violating international law, uh, in Iraq where the United States violated international law, not understanding the situation of others, because in reality, from the power of love, there are no others. We all breathe the same phytoplankton gifted air. We are all blessed with the same power of life. So one of the issues that I think of our time that's so important is to change the approach to how the security of nations is approached from pursuing security by ongoing threats to identifying the very real common interests we all have. That's what, that's what the universe is telling humanity today. That's what the climate's about. That's what the pandemic's about. While we're, we're on the, we're, while we're got to negotiate out of this, uh, out of the crisis in Ukraine, the tundra in Northern Siberia and Russia is on fire. And our grandchildren will suffer from that. They won't suffer from whoever governs Ukraine, but they will suffer from our failure to identify our common interests. And why are we not? Because we are institutionalizing fear and adversity. The great wise from time immemorial, from the time of the Upanishads, and it's over the parliament in India, this, the, the admonition that says the world is one family. This is a truth that we have to become our abiding principle. So the approach that I'm engaged with the World Academy of Arts and Science and the Global Security Institute and the United Nations that we're engaged in now is advancing the principle of human security. Human security starts with the premise that security is obtained by addressing real human needs the needs of the daily lives of people as the essential framework, not the security of the state, but the security of people. And that means in our daily lives, loving people, using things. And things include ideas. There are things, things include the objects and ideas. We have to put the sanctity and the dignity of each person ahead of our ideas and see things from their eyes. So I saw, I'm bearing witness, I saw a human being faced with death, with evil, with anger, and respond with the power of love. I can't deny what I've seen, and I, I feel responsible to bring that into action with the skills with which God has gifted me. My skills are in law, and my skills are in institutional advocacy, but anyone can bring those skills into action whether it's giving somebody a glass of water with love and kindness, whether it's bringing justice where there's injustice, where there's bringing peace, where there's hatred and anger. But the first place where, where selfless service has to take place is within our own hearts. And we have to go from love of self to selfless love. May that power of transformation be known. And Audrey, thank you for bringing us together for this message. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And now we're going to have our next presenter, Sadviji Bhagavati Saraswati. Sadviji serves as Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance, President of Divine Shakti Foundation, and Director of the International Yoga Festival at Parmath. Originally from Los Angeles, California, she's lived for the last 25 years in India and has initiated, been initiated in the order of sannyas by His Holiness Swami Chidanand Saraswati, a highly revered and respected spiritual leader in India. You know, Sadviji is traveling right now. She's uh, in an airplane. And so she sent uh, ahead of time this video, which we will play. Om. Oh. Sadave Bhavant Sukhina, Sadave Santu Niramaya, Sadave Badrani Pashyantu, Ma Kashchit Dukha Bhagavad, Om Shanti 
Shanti, Shanti. May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings attain their highest state of peace and perfection. May no being suffer. Om peace, Om peace, Om peace. What a wonderful joy to be together at this time of World Interfaith Harmony Week when we celebrate, we celebrate our oneness. We celebrate coming together in love, in togetherness as one global family across all of our borders and boundaries of race, of religion, of color, in the recognition that we are one. And it's especially so beautiful to be here in the name of Aloha, the name of love. As it is said so beautifully, love is all you need. Love is the answer. We know that love, of course, makes us feel better inside. But science also shows us now that actually loving others, being in love, not only romantically, but being in love with anyone, actually makes us healthier physically. The chemicals that love causes our brains and bodies to secrete actually bring us great health in our body. Obviously, great health in our mind and in our emotions. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, actually, who you love. Could be a husband or wife. Could be a mother or father. Could be a child. Could be a best friend. Could be the tree in your backyard. Because the truth is, when we really love, when we love the essence, the content, rather than just the form and the packaging, what we're loving is God. When we love only the form, the body, that's what we call lust. Real love is love of essence, love of spirit, love of soul. And when we love that, regardless of who we go through to love it. Ultimately, what we are loving through that husband or wife or best friend or mother or child or tree, what we're loving is God. And that love of God transforms us and transforms our world. Here on the banks of Mother Ganga each evening in our sacred lighting ceremony called the Arti. There's a beautiful line that says, Sabse unchi prem sagai. And it means the highest form of love is love of God. So start loving through anyone, but love their essence, love their core, love their truth, and know that you are loving God. And of course, if through your spiritual tradition, through your faith, you can actually directly love God in any name, any form, that's going to transform you and transform the world. Because when we love, we serve. In the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagwan Krishna gives us three paths to God, the path of Jnana Yoga, knowledge, wisdom, the path of Bhakti Yoga, devotion, love, and the path of Karma Yoga, action, service. But they're not actually three separate paths. They are interlinked, interwoven as one. They are three streams into the river of life, the river of divine connection. Because when you love, naturally you serve. When your loved one is sick, you do whatever you can for them. 
even when they're not sick. You bring them breakfast in bed, you massage their feet, you paint them pictures, you write them poems. You do things that you know will make them feel good. So when we love God, when we really love God, then naturally we will love all of the divine creation. And when we love the divine creation, we will serve the divine creation. And that is what we call karm yoga or seva. We don't serve as separate beings. We don't serve as we're the ones who have serving those who don't. We don't serve as us over here serving those over there. We serve as self serving self. It's like if I trip and fall and injure my right leg. The left leg picks up the extra weight. We call it limping. But no one has to say, oh, wonderful humanitarian left leg. Could you pick up some extra weight? The left leg does it automatically because it knows the right leg is self. In the same way, seva is a spiritual practice. The ones we serve are permitting us graciously to experience an expanded sense of self through serving them. So we do seva as our spiritual practice to experience our self in the other, to love and serve God in every form. Mahatma Gandhiji said so beautifully, the best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service of others. So today, let us come together in aloha, in love, in service that stems from that love for all beings of every race, every religion, every color, every species across the planet. And we pray, Asatoma Sadgamaya, Tamsoma Jyotird Gamaya, Mrityordma Amritam Gamaya. O oh Lord, lead us from the falsehood of our separation to the truth of our oneness from the darkness in which we suffer and cause suffering to others, to the light of truth and oneness. O oh Lord, lead us from identification with this physical body, its size, its shape, its color, its story, to identification with the soul, the spirit, the truth that is undivided, unseparate, that is one with you, O oh God, and one with all. Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. My deepest appreciation to Sadviji for taking the time to send this video to us ever filled with her loving wisdom. And there is something about being in the presence of saintly people that can transform our lives. Just as Jonathan Granoff's life was transformed by being in the presence of his beloved master, Bawa Mahayadeen, who is the expression of this infinite, pure and perfect love. Bishop Swing is a founder and president emeritus of the United Religions Initiative, which has grown to be the largest grassroots interfaith organization in the world, which is in over 100 countries. Their work is implemented through numerous cooperation circles that create a global network of those committed to peace and justice that seeks to bridge cultural and communities of faith. I also, he also helped to found Voices of a Nuclear Weapons Free World, a URI UN cooperation circle. Bishop Swing, please share with us about your powerful work. 
Aloha. Audrey, thank you. I have no idea if this story is true, but when I was young, I heard it. A monk left his priory one day and announced to his brothers, I'm going to build a hospital. He went to a little town in Pennsylvania and asked a farmer for some land saying, I need this land to build a hospital. The farmer gave it. Then he went to the local hardware store, picked out some tools that he needed to start the hospital. The owner gave him the tools. Then he went out and started digging. Pretty soon, someone heard the crazy monk was building a hospital. So they got an architect to volunteer plans. And on and on. Eight years went by. And finally, the monk went back to the priory and said to the other monks, I built a hospital. So etched in my heart was this story that on a rainy February night in 1993, I made a pledge to God that I would be a catalyst for the creation of a united religions. I became the monk, only I wasn't going to pursue a vision in a little town in Pennsylvania. I was going to do something audacious in front of the whole world. With no money, with no interfaith credentials, with no idea of what a united religions might look like, I began the journey. What in the world was I thinking? I thought that if I could hold up in the air a vision whose day had come, whose merit was so self-evident that wise and resourceful people would rally around me and supply the expertise that were, was required. If a united religions was born, then religions would move away from deadly competition and for the sake of the world, the earth, they might actually work together. With my wife, Mary, we funded the enterprise on a preacher's salary, traveled the world to field test the vision and did everything in our power to launch a united religions. Short story, it failed. Clearly, religious leaders of the world wanted no part of my vision or anything that sprung from me. At that moment, it would have been so easy to give up. Something inside me really did want to give up. But something else in me was not undone by failure. As the poet Rilke says, this is how he grows, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. Out of the rich soil of the idea of a united religions sprang the promising seed that grew into a grassroots united religions initiative. Here I am, 29 years later, still on the trail of a united religions initiative. Do I look back and ponder URI's beginnings? Seldomly, if ever. What holds my rapt attention are such questions as, who will, be, who will the new ED be? Who will the new global chair be? How long will it take to make the new governance structure operational? In keeping with today's theme of self-service, I look back on those 29 years and here are three things that make sense of it all for me. Number one, I think that billions of people around the world practice aloha, selfless service, first of all, because it is in their nature. Whether through birth or culture, people are ready to serve members of their family 
or good causes that communities rely on. It comes naturally for so many people, maybe not all, but for so many. Number two, selfless service springs from a way, springs forth from a way of seeing. If what I see, a hurting person, a compelling agenda, a goal, a God, if I, if I catch a glimpse of the vision, then I feel urged to serve selflessly. And three, I would guess that 99% of selfless service in the world is quiet, unselfconscious, and mostly unnoticed. And also, I'll bet that it, selfless service makes the world go round and makes hum, the human race human. At this precarious moment, with the world's temperature rising and with nuclear weapons arsenals expanding, inside you and me is a Pennsylvania monk who needs to leave home and pursue a healing path, practice self-service long enough so that we can finally say, I build a hospital. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bishop Swing. And uh, thank you for sharing your three important points, which I, I would probably agree with that many people are already doing service selflessly with great love and are unknown and unnoticed. And of course, that's what selfless service in its true sense is supposed to be about. And thank you for mentioning about a hospital because our next speaker, Dr. Sakina Yakubi, has actually built a hospital, many, many clinics, uh, legal clinics, health clinics, and she is just a force of nature. So Dr. Sakina Yakubi is president and executive director of the Sakina Fund and founder and chief executive officer of the Afghan Institute of Learning, which was established to provide teacher training to Afghan women to support education for boys and girls and to provide health education to women and children. Under Dr. Yakubi's leadership, AIL established itself as a groundbreaking visionary organization that works at the grassroots level and empowers women and communities to find ways to bring education and health services to rural and poor urban girls, women, and other poor and disenfranchised of guns. So Dr. Yakubi, please share with us about your powerful work, which you continue to work at tirelessly year after year. Thank you. First of all, um, aloha to my dearest friend, sister, mentor, teacher that I love dearly, Ardi Katawaga. It is so honored to be here under your presence and all the other great, wonderful, wonderful human beings that they are really providing service. It's a learning experience for me and I really appreciate this uh, platform. Um, it is, uh, this is the time of the, um, that we really share love, compassion and wisdom because the world needs it. As I will speak to you, my country is, this is the 21 years, 2021 was the hardest year that ever for 30 years of my work I experienced. Afghanistan have been through a lot for this 2021 year, this one. It has been drought, it has been um, um, quit, it has been a collapse of a government, and also it has been the indifference of different nations regarding to Afghanistan. This has been really troubled my country so much. As a result, today we are losing our youth, our young people by suiciding or by running away from the country. We are losing our young generation by being sold to other family, by being 
going through early child marriage, just marrying to somebody who is four times of their age. Today, the world is just watching and seeing what's going on to Afghanistan. Afghanistan is going through a lot of hardship. What am I doing? What I can do? One person, as usually I did, through two systems, 20 years, each system came and left. Each one of the systems set up by the blood of my people. They said they were corrupted. They really did not do what they supposed to do and they passed. And now is another system is coming. And every day there is something different. Every day there is something going on. And what we can do as a human being, what personally I can do. My point is that ignorance is something that really created human being to react the way that people are reacting through poverty, through ignorance, through um, bad health. People react because they are ignorant, because they have no education, because they have no training, because they don't know better what is love, because through hatred, because the, the way that they feel they have been prejudiced against through differences, through ethnic groups. Different ethnic groups are fighting for another ethnic group. And my point is, through all this year, have been that try to sit in my corner and try to put people together, united people, by love, care, wisdom, and compassion. And that, you might say, well, why Afghanistan is right now is going through the process that is right now doing, if you have been done that. I ask this question from myself sometimes, but you know, this pathway is not the easy pathway. You all know that this pathway takes time, takes patience, and takes, again, love and care from the heart. And if the love and care is not there and patience are not there, it's very, very slow process. And that is the process that we are struggling with it. We are trying to educate our society. We are trying to bring education to every child who are not able to get this education. We are trying to bring education to every family. We are trying to change every family to change this nation. And through that process, we have reached 14.5 million people so far. As oddly, my dearest friend said, we have built clinic, we built hospital, we built a school, and we built women learning center that every one of them operate by cycling through going through a cycle of 2,000 to 1,500 people a day. So that is the way we operate, and that's the way we work. But I really would like to say to Audrey, thank you for doing this, bringing this platform to the world. People need to share. People need to love each other. People need to really get advantage of days like this and be able to go and love the spirit of somebody. Really try to be somebody who give a piece of spirit to somebody. Do you know today through poverty in Afghanistan, we see human suffering that it has, the nation never saw that such a thing. People are dying on the street by thousands. People are selling their wonderful children, two years, five years, 10 years to the street for bag of rice, for bag of flour, for piece of bread. People are letting their children to marry, as, again, as I said, to a, a, a man who is 50 years old, a girl who is 10 years old. It has been horrible. When I look at through those videos, when I communicate with my staff, it's break my heart. I cry. Most of the night I cry these days because it is suffering. It's getting so much. It's so much. And the world is watching. Yes, there is a system that they say they provide humanitarian assistance to Afghanistan through the United Nations. But my point is that why the UN or the world government doesn't share and cooperate and coordinate with other organizations who are on the ground, that the process go faster, 
they carry the humanitarian assistance into Afghanistan, but it's set there for a while to go through the red tapes. We are there. We can collaborate. We can coordinate. We are in 16 provinces of Afghanistan. We can reach door to door every day that my staff get out of the office and both sides of the street. They see thousands of people straight lying on the ground. In this harsh winter, we have a cold weather. There is flood right now, water pouring, rain is pouring from the sky. People are sitting without the tent or under a tent, which you guys can take it in the summer camp and sit under that. You can imagine how those children are freezing to cold weather and with hunger, with hunger. stomach is empty. There is no, no shelter. There is no cover. And they are trying to provide humanitarian assistance. Every month, twice a month, we provide humanitarian assistance. We provide shelter to our clinic. We provide food, but that's not enough. It's not enough. And my point is that, please, I am crying loud for the people of Afghanistan. That please listen to cries. Listen to the situation in Afghanistan and try to reach out for those people. We are human. We are equal. God created all of us equal. This justice has to be done. People has to realize what's happening to Afghanistan. For 30 years, Afghanistan have been in conflict. Constantly people are coming and going and killing and destroying and uh, completely ignoring the poor people. People are bringing people from Afghanistan into this country or in Europe. It does not achieve that much because 35 million people cannot be left from Afghanistan to other nations. There are 35 million people sitting out there, hungry, without job, without everything. And those people need help. Those people need assistance. If we do not reach Afghanistan right now, if we do not give the help that they require now, Afghanistan is completely is going to demolish. There is going to be a day that it would be too late, and then we could not do that much. And Afghanistan is a target place for all terror people who are going to breathe from that ground and going to spread all over the world. And if today those people are in our door, tomorrow is somebody's else door. I think every nation should come to the realization that humanitarian assistance is needed, humanity is needed. We all are human. We need humanity to rise up. Today, I just find out from uh, the last one of my good friend, Paul Farmer. Paul Farmer was an excellent humanitarian. He was providing assistance, help, to all the people in Africa and Asia and everywhere. And that kind of humanitarian, we are losing. We don't have that much. We all have to open our heart. My sister says that love comes from the heart. And when we give from the heart, it stay in the heart. Please, I want to this voice get to the people and people realize what's going on in the world. Thank you very much, Audrey. I really appreciate every one of you. I learn from each one of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sakina. And now let's go into our conversational aspect, and we're going to start questions and answers so that our panelists will have a deeper opportunity to take us through the more and more about their work. So let's begin with uh, Ben Bowler. Ben, you know, it's just remarkable that in a relatively short period of time, you have been able to build this international platform of connectivity. So tell us how people can get involved further in both World Unity Week and Peace Week 2022. Thank you so much, Audrey. What a magnificent program. What beautiful sharing uh, and how inspiring to hear these stories of selfless service and lives given uh, to, to Aloha and Selfless Service. But the idea of World Unity Week and Peace Week later this year is really what can we do when we come together with all these initiatives, all of these missions, all of these callings and show up as a connected whole, as a visible connected 
whole with their issues such as the nuclear issue that uh, Bishop Swing and Jonathan Granoff and connecting that to issues of racism to the sort of humanitarian work that Dr. Sakina is doing in Afghanistan and the incredible work on social healing, Audrey, that you and your organization are doing interculturally. And what does it look like if we bring all of this together into a connected field that can actually support and empower each other. And so to get involved in World Unity Week, the very best way is to come to actually is an assembly tomorrow. And an assembly is a meeting where we'll hear um, the onboarding and how organizations, partners, co-conveners can get involved. We now have close to 300 co-convening organizations. This is not the banner of one organization. This is what we as global civil society can do together. So I'm going to put a link into the chat, both here in the Zoom room and on the live stream, um, where you can find that assembly tomorrow. Uh, there'll be great speakers, but even more than that, we'll be in breakout rooms and we'll be finding ways of how we can collaborate, coordinate, connect and show up together. For Peace Week, which is in September, anybody who has an initiative to celebrate around the International Day of Peace, whether it's the weekend before or the weekend after. We want to hear from you. You can connect to us uh, through unity.earth. Uh, you can find and connect with us. You can also contact me, ben, at unity.earth. If you have peace initiatives in September, we want to connect all of the various elements from what uh, is happening on Peace One Day, the UN, what ha is happening that day, to all the many civil society thousands of civil society actions that take place around that time and so we'd encourage people or to connect that way purposeearth.org is also a place where you can see and support uh the work of, of global grassroots activism audrey thank you so much ben and uh we'll move to jonathan granoff now you know jonathan you have a very interesting life you have studied with an enlightened master for many years and you are also an activist in many dimensions and disciplines and um, are there principles that apply to both outer and inner peace and I think that you're well positioned to answer this question because of the work that you do in the world, but also the fact that your heart has been trained by the love of your spiritual master. Great question. Yeah, there, the, all of the principles for spiritual awakening apply to the nations of the world, to the families that we live in and the communities that we're in. I'll just do two really quickly. One, treat others as you want to be treated. That's a universal principle articulated in different nuances in all of the faith traditions of the world. Either that one way, don't harm others as you would not wish to be harmed. Treat all lives as one. Just, uh, just think of the instances in which that's been applied amongst the nations of the world or misapplied. After World War I, the victims... The people of Germany were victims of the war and crushing reparations were put upon their shoulders. The world received the chaos of Nazism. After World War II, the victors used a different principle, the Marshall Plan, building up the economies and culture of Germany and Japan, ending up with trading partners and democracies. Look at the difference in the affairs of nations in that regard. Today, we're in a situation where none of the major countries are looking at the interests of others. They're not doing that. They're modernizing, upgrading, and spending literally trillions of dollars on weapons of mass destruction because they're operating on a principle adverse to the spiritual principle, the principle of the Roman maxim prepare for peace and receive peace in today's world. Another principle would be separate from yourself that which separates you from others. In their personal anger, falsehood, jealousy, pride, vanity, separate us from one another, but that also separates us from our own very soul. That separates us from the qualities of love, compassion, patience, peacefulness, justice, and tolerance that bring us together with the power of love within the soul. And when nations treat other nations as they want to be treated, when nations see that we have a common humanity that must be affirmed, that's when peace and tranquility is received amongst the nations of the world. 
Thank you so much, Jonathan. You have consistently over the years and for the many years that I have known you, always spoken about the power of the heart and love to transform. So thank you. And now Bishop Swing, I would like you to share with us who were the people or the occasions that really inspired selfless service in your life? Yeah, um, first of all, I, I would say my mother. Uh, she was a single mother raising two children, had a little job at a, the Ohio Valley Bus Company and uh, I did the washing, <laughs> got the food, paid off a house, loved us, took care of us. And she was, a, she, she served us. And that, uh, that impact, uh, I wanted to be like her. I uh, followed Jesus who said, I came not to be served, but to serve. And if you're ordained into the diaconate, uh, the first order, you're, uh, that's the servant order. Uh, you might become a priest, you might become a bishop, but basically you're a servant. Um, and then I love the story of the feeding of the 5,000 with a couple of little pieces of bread and a couple of fish. Jesus didn't uh, perform a miracle and say, here's a mound of food. He said, here's just a little bit, go out and just give it away. And when they went out and started giving it away, it was, ama it was amazing how much more they had to give because uh, they were living in uh, uh, a new kind of uh, generosity. So um, uh, self-service or <laughs> selfless service, um, uh, that's it. Th th those are the, the big influences on my life. Thank you so much, Bishop Swing. And here we have the beautiful mother uh, leaving an impression on her heart. So thank you for sharing that. Very moving. So now, uh, Dr. Yakubi, you know, I'd like you to share with us, what was your goal all those years ago when you first started uh, the Afghan Institute of Learning? Thank you, our own sister, Abri. Um, First of all, um, I just want to uh, share this with you because uh, from the beginning, my intention was to really, when I start uh, Afghan Institute of Learning in the refugee camp, to really um, empower the women, to really teach the women to be self-sufficient, to try to help the women to um, have education, have stability in their life, to really help the women to go through gender equality, uh, justice, and this was my real objective for the beginning. But also when I look at the camp and I saw this part woman widow and traumatized through the war. When I look at the children who were really um, sort of hopeless, they didn't have anything for the future to look. And when I, I, I look at the young men, who are sitting there and wishing to die. And the young women who are sitting there without any education or without any hopes, I felt it. There must be something that we could change this life. And that thing was education, to really educate them, to really teach them how to be themselves, how to love, how to share. And from the beginning, that was my objective, to try to reach out and try to change this mentality and try to bring hope to the hopeless one. And that's what I was trying to do from the beginning of my work. Well, thank you so much, Sakina, because you certainly have touched hundreds of thousands of people. So now, Ben, uh, I'd like to ask you another question. You know, over these years that I have known you, you have always been a very cheerful presence. And uh, I know that uh, you deal with many people all around the world. Uh, share with us, what is your cause for optimism in these troubling times? Thank you, Audrey. Um, well, firstly, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of um, despair. And uh, I want to acknowledge that there is a lot of uh, uh, people and, and the sense in our own lives, in my own life too, of, of sometimes not having optimism. 
I remember being fortunate, being fortunate enough to be in Greenland with Jonathan Granoff and John Raymer and others and seeing the, the melting ice and, and perhaps for the first time in my life really felt overwhelming despair that it's so hard to change minds and hearts and it's so hard to get people's attention and it's so hard to change uh, human behaviour. But to answer your question, Audrey, what gives me optimism is just like the gathering here, I believe that the most powerful force in the universe um, love, God, is showing up through the calling that you see represented here today. And I know, because I have a privileged position, like many of us do, to see thousands of people who are responding to that call. So this is um, part of the intervention into the world of the eternal and infinite. And, and that gives me a sense of hope and optimism, particularly when we come together as brothers and sisters, support each other's calling, support each other's initiatives, and find ways to organize based upon these universal spiritual principles. So, Audrey, you give me hope and optimism. Bishop Swing and, and uh, Dr. Sakina, Jonathan Granoff, and, and all of the beloved community that is showing up at this time, working in ways humble and some ways at the institutional highest levels, from the, everything in between, responding to the call within that still small voice within, and then taking selfless service and action and doing it in a community and doing it together. That gives me overwhelming hope and optimism. And I'm excited to continue to advance that together because the power is within us and before us. And together we can accomplish all things. Thank you so much, Ben. And um, I want to go uh, to Jonathan. You know, Jonathan, you have shared uh, so eloquently about uh, the power of the heart to love, but you also are a brilliant lawyer. I know you have won an award uh, for your beautiful film work on the Constitution. And uh, you also um, have been a, a fantastic litigator and you're also the scribe for the Nobel Peace Laureates. So I wanted to ask you, do ideas matter? And if so, can you give us an example in your life? Yes, well, ideas, ideas matter enormously. Uh, as I mentioned, the Roman maxim, prepare for war, receive peace, or peace through military domination and the pursuit of domination, and the idea that, uh, that military, military means will bring well-being was exactly what caused the United States to spend $2 trillion in its venture in Afghanistan without taking care of the needs of the American soldiers who were there, without taking care of the needs of the people of Afghanistan, how much better it would have been. It was all out of fear. It was all out of, a, of an idea that the people there are different than the people in Cincinnati or New York an idea that people are different. The same thing is what got the United States into Vietnam. And it's the same problem of othering other people as different than oneself that is the problem presently in the Ukraine. So it is the other idea of human unity, of our common humanity, that every individual is blessed with the dignity of the presence of the divine, that every child comes into this world in a state of purity and that every single person at some point will suffer old age, sickness, and death. And then we are all in this together. No one's above you. No one's below you. The principle of the equality and dignity of every individual. That's an idea. But that idea happens to be true. The idea that some nations, some races, some religions are superior to others, that's an idea that's false. So ideas matter a great deal. And they have a power of change. The idea that all humans are created equal was, is an ought, and it's a compelling ought. It doesn't, it's not self-evident, but it's an ought to strive for. So an idea, also an idea to strive for, a vision, a compass, and the compass, of course, is to treat other lives as one wants to be treated. That's the expression, that's the ethical expression of the power of love. So that's another idea that can be put straight and center for all of our institutions. Ideas matter a great deal. And then false ideas lead us to false conclusions. The idea that the natural world 
is an externality in general accounting principles. So corporations are not accountable for the damage they do to the environment in their accounting. They don't have to report on it. That's a, an illusion. The natural world is not an externality. It's part of our own being. So truth matters. The pursuit of truth it matters a great deal. And um, as soon as as soon as the the pursuit of truth is minimized, as soon as people become cynical toward it, great dangers arise because human beings have the capacity of being true. And you will not find truth outside until you have honesty and truth within yourself. Another truth, another good idea. You have to be true within yourself. Truth will follow outside if you're true inside. Yes, thank you so much, Jonathan. As we know, uh, most of the great spiritual uh, teachers have indicated the importance of truth, like know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And of course, Mahatma Gandhi's Satyagraha, truthfulness in creating a, a movement that really expelled the British from India and uh, allowed the uh, Indian people to have self-governance. So yes, the power of ideas. So Bishop Swing, um, you know, I you have touched so many lives, thousands and hundreds of thousands of lives. And I'd like you to share with us what have been some of the results that came from your selfless service. Yeah, uh, I think the first thing that comes to my mind would be it would have to do with AIDS. Um, early on in 1980s, uh, there was a member of our staff, uh, 36 years old, who came down with this disease that nobody had a name for, and I'd go see him in the hospital uh, all the time and watched him die. And uh, it turned out this was uh, uh, called AIDS. And so uh, San Francisco became epicenter uh, for the AIDS epidemic. And uh, I'd, I'd go to a, a church and there'd be 25 people dead uh, from AIDS. I'd go to another church, uh, uh, 40 people were dead from AIDS, average age 35. Uh, and I'd go to another and another. It was like a war zone, just burying people, meeting with the parents, uh, meeting with their loved ones, their lovers, their, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, uh, I, I began to, uh, to talk about it. I began to uh, speak around the world. The president of the United States invited me to the White House with Tony Fauci, and we would give briefings to the president on what's going on. Um, but I, I became a member of the American Foundation for AIDS Research. And uh, I'll never forget uh, those meetings when everybody was dying and there was no help. There was no hope. I mean, it was just, it was, there was, we were trying trials, but nothing was helping. And we decided we're gonna have a new motto. And the motto was, we're in for the cure. Uh, it didn't have to happen today. It didn't have to happen tomorrow, but it's going to happen. And we're in for the long haul. We're in for the cure. And after a few years, uh, the cure came in terms of, uh, of three ingredient cocktails that uh, kept people's lives going and uh, turned, turned the world around in terms of, uh, of AIDS. So, um, oh, you just give yourself to to the pursuit of um, the cure. And in time, if you just stick with it, stick with it, stick with it, in for the cure, the cure comes. That's my hope. Well, that also requires a lot of courage because in those days, there was a lot of misinformation, misunderstanding about AIDS and its, you know, uh, uh, possibility of contagion. So the fact that you were in the front lines of uh, this disease coming up early in your community uh, speaks well of you so much, Bishop Swing. So thank you. So now Sakina, you know, I want to ask what made uh, your commitment to Afghan women and children for nearly 30 years? And over this time, you've seen so much change in your country. And I'd like to ask you, what was it that kept you going when difficulties arose, especially in a conflict-torn nation, the conflicts which seem endless? And tell us what motivated you. Thank you, Arjeev. 
as uh, the Reverend Swing said that when you are in a situation that you see day after day, things are just keep going the same thing. And you get to learn to say, okay, what, what can I do? There are days that you get desperate and you get like sort of devastated, but you know that love that you have inside and that belief that you have that God is going to help us and we keep going forward. That is one thing that I really feel that the love of my, my, my community, the love of my um, nation keep me going on, taking me to keep going. That was one thing. A second thing is that as I keep seeing like sort of devastated ups and down during these 30 years, going through all kinds of change from government to government, from corruption to corruption, and, and temptation and all kinds of things that they were available. And I keep saying to myself, how can we keep ourselves, just keep going and not touching the dirty world, not touching and not coming close to the dirty world, which was there. And how we can really change this mind. And when I look at the young people, when I work with the young people, the young generation, the energy, the potential, the honesty, the loving that I could see through them, it's really helped me to gain energy from them and push me to go work harder and harder. And the hopeless that also I saw them that they are so hopeless. And once you work with them, they get energy, they become empowered and they really want to do it. While nothing is there available and there are so many um, uh, odd things against them to go forward, but they keep going because they are angry for uh, education, thirst for education, and they keep coming, no matter if bullet come from the air, if uh, the, the bomb is coming from the ground, no matter if the kidnapping in behind them, they just keep pouring and they keep coming and they are fearless. And so that really helped me also personally that no matter what, I have to keep going on this. And that, that was my one way of really continuously doing that. A second, really light my day at the preschool children. Every time that I see that their eyes is lighting up and they play and they are happy in the playground because they have an environment to play and they have a place to study and they have a teacher to um, give them love and give them sort of a closeness that they need. And that also, it's really helped me to put myself together and continuously go through what hardship I go and to just reach out for those young children. And that was really the reason. Thank you so much, Sakina. You know, this is such powerful sharing from powerful people about your powerful work. And, uh, you know, I, I'd like to have uh, given opportunity to each of you to provide conclusory remarks that you would like our audience to take home from your sharing today. So let's start with Ben Bowler. Ben, what, uh, what is the important point that you would like all of our listeners to take home from your sharing, your work, and who you are today? Thank you, Audrey, and thank you so much for this <clears throat> incredible gift of aloha. Um, I'm, I'm feeling the quote by Howard Thurman, you know, ask not what the world needs, but what makes you come alive, because what the world needs most is people who have come alive. And, and I feel like if uh, each of us can just really uh, attune to the calling within, um, there is a plan. Uh, ideas do matter, and yet at some point we're not necessarily only going to be able to think our way out of the mess we're in, uh, there is a higher plan and you are an instrument. Each one of us is an instrument. So attuning to that calling, which is uniquely yours. You may be inspired by others. You may be um, impressed by others, but your call is your call is, is powerful and unique. And 
I feel that the greatest thing we can do is each of us to attune that and then come into a community of others that are on that path. And sometimes we fall over <laughs> two steps forward, three steps backwards. I mean, we've heard it from the speakers today. It's not a straight line. Selfless service is not a straight line. Uh, there are many zigs and zags. So just give ourselves the gift of aloha as well and self-love. Tune into uh, that call and connect with others and build communities. Um, and therein lies the great hope of transformation for ourselves and for our communities and, yes, for our world. So thank you and to each and every one who has shared today and to you, Audrey, and the International Academy of Multicultural Cooperation. Great thanks. Uh, and many blessings and more strength to your own. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Jonathan Granoff, your concluding remarks, please. It's very important that all of us realize that we all have moral agency to make ourselves sanctuaries of peace. But today, none of us are separate in a way that humanity was never brought together like it is today, where every, every global issue is local and local issues are global. So I think that we should all be demanding of our leaders of the institutions that are impacting the world today and into the future to answer three questions. You don't have to have expertise in this, but our leaders do. And there are people that have expertise in these issues. Every leader should be asked, what are you doing to protect the climate? Because that then gets into biodiversity, it gets into uh, economics, it opens up all kinds of doors. What are you doing to protect the climate too? What are you doing to eliminate poverty? For the first time in human history, we have the scientific, social, and, and, and economic capacity to eliminate the crushing poverty, the poverty I'm talking about, where no matter how hard a person works, it doesn't change their physical circumstances. The crushing poverty where a mother has to decide which child will live tomorrow. The crushing poverty that's so unnecessary, that's imposed, that decisions are made. What are you doing to eliminate that poverty? And three, what are you doing to eliminate nuclear weapons? The trillions of dollars spent in the apex of human madness. The more we perfect the weapon, the less security we obtain. But that, that, that involves an entire mindset. So what are you doing to protect the climate? What are you doing to eliminate poverty? What are you doing to get rid of nuclear weapons? Three questions the Nobel Peace Laureates said every person should be asking their leaders. And fourth, I want to add one. What am I doing? to find the deepest, purest love within my heart, the heart that I came with when I was an infant and I responded to love. What am I doing to find that love and then bring it into action? Because if you find that love and you're cynical and don't bring it into action, it will fade. But if you bring it into action, your consciousness will be transformed and the mystery of the power of love that creates the infinite stars in the heavens, every leaf on every tree, every blade of grass, and every child that's born into the world, that miracle that's going on of the power of love expressed in the abundance of life and the universe will bless and be known to you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. And now, uh, Bishop Swing, share with us your, uh, you want us to take away from today. I would say um, in the in the phrase selfless service, uh, it begins with self. Um, the self can get very discouraged and the self could get defeated and the self could come up against great opposition. Uh, and therefore, you got to wrestle with yourself. Uh, uh, selfless service. Service means I'm going to serve something that's greater, higher, or compelling, uh, that draws my heart, my mind, my life in that direction. Uh, and so uh, maybe life is the pursuit of where, where, is, where do I find that which, uh, which I admire, love, uh, uh, see in a vision and then and then selfless less means uh you just gotta with all your stuff that's going on inside you you still tamp it down in order to get going and to keep going 
uh, toward toward the vision, toward the love, toward the person, toward the cause, toward whatever. So it's a great, uh, when I first heard selfless service, I thought, oh my, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. I, I find this is really, this is really good. I've questioned some of my friends at lunch or, to say, what do you think about selfless service? And it's amazing how many people want to talk about that. Uh, I've had great conversation with friends who, you know, just once you open it up, they began to talk. So, we, Audrey, you're onto something really important and profound. And thank you for including me and for uh, for having this occasion. Thank you so much, Bishop Swain. Well, you know, you have been a servant, a tireless worker and servant for the divine. And of course, uh, this also gives us deep meaning and purpose in our lives, even as we face challenges every moment that we live, that the cumulative effect of how we have lived our lives and what we have done in our lives we can look back and say, we have found the higher purpose and meaning in life. So thank you so much for your tireless effort and all of our panelists. And so Sakina Yakubi, please share with us your conclusory remarks. Thank you, Adi. I really think that um, for me, it's something that um, every individual um, are responsible for their action. And I think, that every one of us should listen to our calling and go after that. I think everyone has a calling and that calling should be from your heart to reach out for each other and try to unite with each other. And also, I really believe that as an individual, every one of us has a responsibility to call to our government, to our nation for unity, because going to our government who are an institution who are able to reach out more than individual, we can bring the world together. Today, the world is being separated by means of all kinds of um, war, uh, weapon, uh, poverty, disease, um, ignorance, all kinds of things. The world is being separated, pulling away. And we need as a world nation, as a global, globally, to put everybody together through love and harmony, because we have seen through our lives that without the love and harmony, there is nothing is achievable. And that's I really believe. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom, Dr. Yakubi. And I would like to express my deepest appreciation to all of our panelists today who took us on a journey of reflection and introspection to examine what aloha, love is, and how it can be manifested in our lives through selfless service. You know, it is fascinating to note that the aloha spirit is actually codified in Hawaii and the section of Hawaii revised statutes chapter 5 section 7.5 says this about aloha spirit aloha spirit is the coordination of mind and heart within each person it brings each person to the self each person must think and emote good feelings to others in the contemplation and presence of the life force, aloha, the following unuhi laula loa may be used. Ahahai, meaning kindness to be expressed with tenderness. Lokahi, meaning unity to be expressed with harmony. Olu olu, meaning agreeable to be expressed with pleasantness. Haa haa, meaning humility to be expressed with modesty. Ahonui, meaning patience, to be expressed with perseverance. These are traits of character that express the charm, warmth, and sincerity of Hawaii's people. It was a working philosophy of native Hawaiians and was presented as a gift to the people of Hawaii.
Aloha is more than a word of greeting or farewell or a salutation. Aloha means mutual regard and affection and extends warmth and caring with no obligation in return. Aloha is the essence of relationships in which each person is important to every other person for collective existence. A, sound, a very wise person, Pilahi Pakisa, said this, these are traits of character that express the charm, warmth, and sincerity of Hawaii's people. It was a working philosophy of native Hawaiians and was presented as a gift to the people of Hawaii. And so mahalo to our panelists. Please do visit Hawaii because have you ever heard of such beautiful words being codified in the Hawaii Revised Statutes and the Aloha Spirit, which permeates the land of Aloha. So may you all come and experience this. And mahalo to our panelists and the Interfaith Ohana of Hawaii and all of you who are joining us today to honor those wherever they may be who are giving the gift of Aloha love in selfless service. May you be inspired by what you have heard today and put into practice right where you are, this special gift of love. Mahalo and aloha nui loa to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, infinite blessings to everyone. Thank you.